I think I have everyone uh, lifted except for our presenter today. And um, I have the privilege of introducing for us now the Reverend Dr. John Kinney. Uh, Dr. Kinney has been uh, part of the School of Theology for, gosh, most of his life. I think he started when he was a child as the dean and has been uh, crafting and creating and leading and guiding uh, the School of Theology for many years. But he's also in his spare time and maybe more uh, closer to his identity is the pastor of Beaver Dam. Um, help me, did I get it right? Ebenezer Baptist Church, Beaver Dam, uh, Virginia, and has been there for uh, since, since God was a child and uh, led that congregation through many, many years and, and growth and vision. Uh, Dr. Kinney is gonna share with us today about um, congregations and the ways in which we might consider where God is already at work in uh, our ministries and where we can fan the flames that might uh, that might help us to burn brighter. Dr. Kinney, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Dr. Jansen, and uh, good afternoon, uh, friends and colleagues. Uh, I too am honored to be able to uh, share with you today, and I thank you for the invitation. I always start out, it's almost just like I, when I'm teaching my classes, um, I don't claim to be an expert. I commit myself to being a seeker. Uh, I live my life learning and excited about how, how every moment of existence provides an opportunity to be exposed to something that stretches both your mind, your consciousness, uh, and, your, and your behavior. I've been uh, involved in um, theological leadership for some time, believe it or not, I first came to Virginia Union in 1969. And it's 1969, I sat as a student, left there and went and to Columbia University and Union Theological Seminary in New York, uh, and was privileged to be able to earn a PhD. And, uh, uh, and from 1976 uh, till this past June, uh, I was a part of the learning community at the Sam Edu Whit Proctor School of Theology. I was privileged for 27 of those years to serve as, as the dean. Uh, I, I am very grateful that I can share with uh, my call, one of my, my colleague over the year, Dr. McKenzie, uh, my colleague over the years, Dr. Jansen, and also a partner in learning uh, and in more recent years directly affiliated uh, with the teaching ministry at Virginia Union, uh, Dr. Blunt. Um, uh, I have been asked to talk about thriving congregations uh, and what I will share with you again as I share are my own musings and reflections of someone who has been in this, um, this enterprise called uh, faith leadership and I don't make a distinction between the church and the academy. That's one of the things that has gotten me in trouble over the years is because I recognize there are certain parameters and uh, structures that inform both the church and the academy. But I think one of the greatest problems that exist is the fragmentation between loving God with our minds and loving God with our hearts. And the fragmentation between making the academy a place of distance from the church rather than a center of worship where the privilege of study becomes a sacred act. Uh, and to recognize that if I'm a seminary, I exist for the life of the church and to serve God. Uh, through the uh, with, with a particular concern and investment of intellectual energy appropriated to achieve the purposes of God for all creation. Um, we want to talk about thriving congregations. I want to suggest, as I have studied over the years, and every um, tool that I've 
had the privilege of using over the years about thriving congregations, it always starts with the character of leadership. And that is, um, can I say this? A dead leader will have difficulty engendering flourishing in anything. <laughs> there has to be passion, commitment, and a sense of celebration in the one who guides a congregation about uh, the character uh, of ministry, the value of your location and intimacy with God. I always, uh, in some ways, started this way. Um, people will ask me, well, why, why have you been with a church in Negro Foot, Virginia <laughs> for all of these years? And one of the things that I always simply say is this, because I never had a sense that this was not where God put me. That does not mean there were not difficulties. There were almost like times where I believe Jesus even said, um, uh, God, can you consider giving me a new crew? Because this one I've got, got, as long as I've been with him, they still don't get it. <laughs> uh, uh, but on the other hand, there was a deep sense when uh, invitations or opportunities were presented to me. Um, I never felt the hand of God directing me. In every case where I was pulled, it was the desire of some other person or, and I will confess, sometimes the urging of your own ego that suggested that you should be in a bigger place <laughs> or you should be in somewhere like this. And I'm not gonna act like I, I was so uh, sanctified that I was totally immune to those human inclinations that uh, reside in a desire for self-promotion. Um, but I'm thankful to God that I have walked with God in such a way that I find peace in being where I believe God wants me and puts me, whether that was at Virginia Union or whether that was in the, the congregation that I've been privileged to pastor. And I came to this church the same time that I came to Virginia Union. So I first came to this church in 1976 and I'm still there now. So you can do the math. And it's amazing how someone um, who is only 50 years old could be somewhere, <laughs> could be somewhere so long, uh, but, but never, Nevertheless, forgive me, Lord, no, no striking, okay. Uh, but in, uh, in any event, there's a way that I approach this and I think it's the root of thriving for me because you have to thrive in your, per your person and you have to commit to thriving. In scripture, it says God took the human being that God formed and put him or her in a garden and said, I want you to guard it, to keep it, cultivate it, or till it. Well, if I was doing the three-point sermon or four, even four points, first of all, God perceives you, that God still sees you, and God does not create you to abandon you, but God's got his eye on you. And then the second thing is that in, in seeing, God has a place for you. God put the created one in the garden, but if you understand that in God's pudding, God makes provision because he does not put you in a garbage dump, a sterile, empty, lifeless place. He places you in a garden. And then after God perceives you and puts you and provides for you, he purposes you. Wherever I put you, guard it, till it, care for it. And I expect there to be more life there because I have put you there than there was when you got there. And regrettably, some people even in ministry and particularly in leadership, reduce the congregation to an instrument that they use for their personal agendas and elevation. 
So they function in the church through the exercise of a position rather than a fidelity to a called purpose. And my called purpose is to engender flourishing. I engender life. Whether I'm a teacher, the question I raise in the step, when I step into the classroom and if I'm dealing with students in, how do I interact, communicate, and release whatever God has given me in a fashion that it creates flourishing? Have you ever been in situations where the folk who are supposed to be leading you make you feel like you're less diminished or reduced? So when you're through with your experience of them, you feel beat up, <laughs> uh, life goes out of you rather than energy flowing, flowing from you. So in this sense, I believe that flourishing, everything that I've ever read says that a vital aspect of a, of a, of a flourishing or even years ago, uh, like the Auburn Institute used to talk about the marks of a healthy congregation. And one of the things they always mentioned was, is a, a constructive relationship and a productive relationship between leaders and those being led, or servant leaders and those who were being equipped, guided, or nourished by the servant leaders. And I think for me, this is very essential. And for me, part of my own is that um, whether I'm deaning or teaching or pastoring the church, there is passion about where I believe God has put me. There is energy, there is love and a, a sense of joy. As hard as the work was sometime, there was a sense of joy about being faithful to God in where God put me. So when I talk to you, and if I'm privileged to do so, um, that part of the thriving begins with a sense of a passion and an internal sense is, I am responding to a call where God wants me to be. I think some of our greatest joy and the greatest de-energizing of existence is when we're always where somebody else told us we needed to be rather than sensing the call of God. That whether I'm a deacon, whether I am handling finances, uh, whether I'm a choir in the choir, I am functioning where God wants me to be and that my functioning is an act of fidelity to God. Now, when, I, when we look at this, you notice God, God sees you, gives you a place, and the place God gives you is a garden. The way I always look at that is, is simply this. God never puts you somewhere where you don't have the necessary assets in the ground for you to be fruitful. Did you, you, you if you understand that, if God puts you in a garden, now somebody else will look at your church, your situation, your location, and uh, use uh, an interpretation that places a limitation. Can I say this? Because I pastor a, a rural church. Man, I would never be in a place like that if you, and with all you got, you shouldn't be there. Well, you're not a placing me. I want to be where God put me. And if God put me there, guess what? It's a garden. In other words, God has provided in this place. Even though there may be limitations, God has provided the necessary assets and resources that the garden can grow. Now, here's my task. You don't have to read 50 books to discover it. Read that verse, come on, in, in the second chapter of Genesis. I put you there to guard, cultivate, and till it. It goes back to the first story in the chronological story in Genesis. Be fruitful and multiply. Your task is to enter the garden called earth and to function in such a way in the garden 
that there is more life there because you have invested there. Uh, if you look at the whole concept of Western expansion in the United States, what we would do, we would go to an area, burn it up. Come on. We would, in other words, we would drain it of everything we could get from it and then move on to some other ground. And regrettably, some of us have that attitude in the church life. I'm gonna get what I can and then I'm gonna move on. And then, and then here's, here's the amazing thing. This is what you happen. You go to some good soil, burn the soil up and then turn around and say, this soil ain't no good. <laughs> when in fact, anything it lacks is a function of how you operated when you were in that garden. And here's the other thing that I firmly believe, that if you are where God wants you and you are faithful in fulfilling the purpose to bring forth flourish, flourishing, failure is not an option. Then need, now, here's why I was saying, if God put me here and I'm doing everything I can to guard and cultivate this soil, then it's no longer me being judged, it's God. Because if God puts me somewhere, gives me directions of what to do, and I honor the place God sent me and do what God told me, then if there's any failure, then God has not been faithful. And since I know God to be faithful, when I, if I step into a place where I know where it's God want me and I commit to, to being guarding, cultivated, and tilling it, guess what I can guarantee? This garden is going to thrive. This garden is going to thrive. Well, wait a minute. Now I, you, I get really. You're at a. You're at a poor. I'm, this is the language you hear. You at a poor black school. Is that where God put me? Then this is my garden, because God doesn't give me a dump. Now, what am I going to do to make sure it flourishes? If this is the church where God placed me in Negro foot, a church in a fork in the road, huh? With 75 active members, come on. And a very limited budget. Is this where God put me? Then you enter that space guarding, cultivating, doing everything you can to bring, bring forth flourishing. And I believe, I believe, I believe. I believe something thriving will take place. And if there's no thriving, here's what you got to examine. Is this where I'm supposed to be? I'm gonna ask you a real question. Have I committed my own passion and energy that I want to be here? There's nothing worse than trying to guide a people that you don't want to be with in the first place. And I'm, I'm giving you my old, my, my old, old opinion now, okay? You, you can't bring forth life when you dead. I should have said when you are dead. That was, that was Ebonic, you know, when you dead, okay? <laughs> no, what I'm saying is you can't build energy when you have no energy. And I want to suggest to you, energy has nothing to do with age. A whole lot of young folk just as tired as they can be. <laughs> and they're elders who are just so vital. So I don't want to get into, uh, when we talk about energy to get into ageism or things like that, or the age of the congregation, the age, no, 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 no. How do I breathe life into this place? I must say, I must talk about is that a key for me of thriving is you have to thrive yourself. And the key to, you know what I believe the key to self-thriving is a level of authenticity and personal security in yourself that you don't need to reduce the people you lead to monads that you relate to for utilitarian purposes. Now that's, that's, one, of, that's one of those Kenny mouthfuls. That is, once you are empty in yourself, you use every position you got and every organization you lead 
for the purposes of feeding your emptiness rather than releasing for their flourishing. You understand? And, and the, 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 that statement that I made is, you know, you know how you read stuff and when you, were, when you were 30 years old, 40 years ago, and it literally becomes a part of your vernacular. And folks, someone say, where do you get that from? I don't know. That once you are ego or sense of self-deprived or self-negating, and in ministry to promote and elevate yourself, you will reduce the church and people in the church as to monads that you relate to for utilitarian purpose so that they will fill an emptiness in you rather than to be partners in the flourishing and the fulfillment of God's design. So I can't separate. I know where this, this whole brand is about thriving congregations. And, but we had a thing, we did a thing about thriving pastors, but sometimes I think we compartmentalize that. And so, okay, we did this and now we're going to do that. But, the, and the two never meet. If you are not thriving, all of you who sit in leadership positions, if there's not something in you that energizes you with passion about the well being and the flourishing of the people and the communities you lead, you will never have a thriving community. And in some ways, thriving is equated with how it elevates you. And you don't see the big picture that in order to thrive, I might need to change some of my ways or, that's where I'm gonna get in real trouble, I might need to alter the character or the form or the, or, and I'm gonna say this, the position I hold because my present functioning does not contribute to thrive. So guess what I just told you? Sometimes in order to have a thriving congregation, though those who lead have to have a, the capacity to be self-critical and self-assessing in their own functioning. <laughs> that includes me as a pastor. Amen. That's the hardest part in doing that evaluation and an analysis when I can look at some of the ways um, which, uh, which my own functioning. But that's why you have good trusted partners who can help you. Uh, literally, if I was if I was uh, if I was in Dr. McKenzie's class, um, I would have to develop a sermonical thing that is that you never climb to the mountain of your position without taking some trusted partners with you because you never know when you're going to have to have somebody hold you and help you understand your weakness. Somebody else will have to lift up your arms. Amen. Amen. Don't you ever think you rise and you stand in a position and then you exclude everybody else who might be able to help you maintain in the position that victory can be achieved in the valley. Uh, thanks be to God. That's why I have these calls. Some of my colleagues right here, when I talk about 27 years as dean, the only way it could happen, that I had faithful colleagues who, who could help share both the vision, but also say, did you ever think about this dean? Or could you twist this or do you do that? And it's the same thing in, my, in the church. And I will tell you, I'm, I'm sharing with you personal, I'm gonna get into some clear models in a minute, but I firmly believe in order for an organization to have maximum flourishing, I wanna go back. In the beginning, God said, be fruitful and multiply. In the second story, I put you in the garden to cultivate it, same principle. I want you to be fruitful. Regrettably, when we read that, there are two mistakes that I believe we make from a theological perspective in reading that Genesis. First of all, we take male and female and we turn it into gender specification and sexual orientation rather than relational affirmation. It just told you that the productivity that you will do in my name is done in relationship. We've reduced it to Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve, when it's really talking about if fruitfulness is to occur, we must be in relationship. Then it's affirmed and endorsed in the second chronological story, the second sequential story in the uh, uh, Genesis, which may be the first chronologically, 
by it is not good for you to be alone. It establishes that the flourishing reality occurs in relationship. Isn't it sad that most of the time when we build administrative systems in our institutions, they are not relational premise, they're hierarchy premise. Come on, with somebody on top, then there's this one, then there's that one, and then there's that one. What we fail to understand is once hierarchy begins to shape your consciousness, it begins to disrupt the integrity and the authenticity in relationship. Because at some point, I've got to remind you, you're beneath me. And once I think you're structurally beneath me, pretty soon I'll start treating you like what? You're beneath me. And I enter, come on, that's, that's, the, fun, that's the failure, the great failure of why you have white supremacy, it's why you have sexism, it's why you have all of this. Because if people locate their value based upon their position and rank in a hierarchy or a grade of being rather than in authentic relationships. So I identify my value based upon my status in the hierarchy. So guess what? Then you have people who want offices so they can be over something or somebody. And when, whenever you lead with an over under mentality, you do not have the same ethical responsibility that you have with somebody that you consider truly relational. With, with the sexism that exists in the church, do you realize that because we, sometimes in the church we put men over women, that we may be seeding domestic abuse because the very fact that you're beneath me, I don't have the same level of accountability to your person that I do when I walk with you. It all begins when we put God over us because in the beginning God was with us. And then we have the good news of Jesus Christ who says, I am, who presents Emmanuel. God, G Jesus in some way is trying to represent the God we've lost with our alienated consciousness because we start listening to the snake of a God who is above us and threatened us rather than a God who is with us. Thanks be to God for Jesus Christ in that respect. But the sad thing is we take the new wine, put it in the old skin and make Jesus Christ the author of sexism rather than the one who calls us beyond it or calls us beyond racism, calls us beyond. We are now, uh, and I'm preaching now, in a kind of Christo-fascism uh, that is tragic for what it's doing to our nation right now. Uh, if my people it would just humble themselves, okay. All right, now, it, now look, if we see this then, one of the things I believe in, th in thriving is that we need to stop and look at how we've structured ourselves to have some people having value or people perceiving their value based upon their, po their position. And here's one of the things that I teach. I have to meet with my leaders next Saturday and I'm going over this again, the concept of leadership in our church, of servant leadership, anybody, who wants to lead so they can be over something is not spiritually mature enough to lead anything. When you are spiritually mature, you don't lord over, you model what you, what you are about and you guide in such a way, you empower and equip the people you lead. Um, because I'm working on a lot of things, this goes with, I'm showing them how I, we're Baptist, right? How in a traditional Baptist church, when you draw your, your, your administrative flow chart, it'll start out with God. And we even put a hierarchy in the Trinity. I've seen them, God, Jesus Christ, Holy Spirit. And because it's congregational polity, now you put the congregation. Then you have the pastor. And then you have two lines. Come on, one over here, the deacons and the trustees. And they're always fighting about which group is the higher and which one is in control. Uh oh, come on. And then you start breaking down all of these groups. And then people who are ushers now want to be a trustee so they can move up the ranks rather than being faithful wherever God has put. Them. And then I don't move up ranks. I am maturing in my capacity to be a servant leader. I am maturing because I'm full of wisdom and the Holy Ghost. I'm maturing and I will be the last one to be the source 
of a hierarchy where I make people or feel like they're nobody. And here's the problem it creates for us as pastors. If you raise people in that hierarchical model, in that model, and I would say this, the Christian church is more structured like the Roman army than it is a fellowship of disciples. And you got ranks and you got colors and you got titles. Now there may be, can I put, here's, here your, here's your big words again, family. There may be functional differentiation for the achievement of a purpose, but never allow functional differentiation to lead on, to ontological gradation where some people have value based upon their function that reduces other folk who don't have that function. And you start thinking that folk are beneath you rather than partners who walk with you. Um, and the, the model that dominates the church now is the hierarchy. It dominates institutions. And people are fighting for their, uh, uh, what they can control rather than how do we function together as a team to achieve a purpose for flourishing in this. Functional differentiation, yes, there are jobs that I, I'm the pastor, I have to do this job but I never want anyone to feel like they're beneath me because I'm the pastor. I don't want, we don't, I, when, I'm gonna just say it. Uh, when I was growing up, uh, I was part of a church and I would hear, to, hear my mother talking on the phone and say, yeah, Deacon so-and-so the biggest lover in the church. Well, I grew up with the understanding that deacons were the biggest lovers. I didn't understand what they were talking about, but, but I like that. And what it means, there's a, there's a book about deacons and it says, when you become a deacon, you give up the right, if there is such a right to participate in a church fight. Because your purpose is not to join the sides of the fight, but to bring healing in the life of the body. Ooh, is it flourishing? Now, if, 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 if we push this, if we push this, even when I moved into administration, I would go to enable to, you got to inspect what you expect. Go around, inspect it, and if it's wrong, have them do this. Guess what? Guess what I believe? To create flourishing, you have to model and embody what you expect. So if I expected the people I led to be good teachers, I had to take time to learn. And I had to sit down with Christian educators and for help me understand what it meant to be an educator and not just an expert in my field. Do y'all un? Because we should have excellence in teaching, not just excellence in the discipline. I had to sit down and go, huh? And, and most people don't know it. I went to uh, workshops at Harvard by accident on, on looking, I went to a workshop on failing institutions and why they were failing. And you know one of the primary reasons they were failing? A lack of mission clarity. And they took failing business and showed that they got themselves so diverse that they were no longer identified for excellence in a particular product. Oh, that really helped me when I became Dean. Who are we? And we aren't here to try to please the world. We aren't here. And people will say, you need to be like, no, I got in trouble because I went somewhere in the place in order to get some money. They said, well, who do you benchmark as your standards? And I said in my answer is, well, I look at all of them, but I'm not, try I'm not using them as benchmarks. I'm trying to create a benchmark. I want Virginia Union to become the standard. <laughs> How you, do you, you understand that? That's not arrogance. It's like saying, we're, we're going to model who we are. We, but never forget that concept. You, you're not clear about what you're doing and what you want to achieve. Y'all remember years ago, um, that in churches, it was a common practice. First of all, have you identified the mission of this church? 
And have you now, have you gone to every ministry you got and can they articulate how what they do contributes to the mission? Well, I'm going I'm to use my own the church where I'm privileged to pastor as an example. When I went to pastor there, they had, they, they had groups that had more money than the church and operated totally outside of the church, but they had their services to raise money at the church. <laughs> oh, 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 you all don't know about that. I know all you all are too sophisticated. I'm a country preacher. Huh? And we there was no mission. Everybody was kind of doing their own thing in the name of Ebenezer Baptist Church. What is our mission? Let's be clear. And how does this contribute to the realization of our mission? And so we literally had to do away with some ministries and things because they were not ministries serving the mission of the church. Many of them were what? Personality controlled and directed and even family. Now that caused some tension, but we had to, we had to, we had to become a healthy church. Because they, it was fragmented because they were literally had groups in the church trying to control ministries to the degree they were competing with each other, fighting each other, who could see, who could do, raise the most money, do this, do that. Hey, all right. Now, that's, that's, my, that's my own personal digression based upon, that's something that came back up in me. Uh, push that back down and get back to business. Now, all right. Now, here, here I, I say that because I, when I talk about vitality, uh, I just had my 76th birthday. But uh, I'm alive, y'all. I'm beginning to understand that you got to overcome the last enemy called death. But you don't overcome it when you die. You overcome it while you're living. <laughs> don't get a death attitude, a death modality. And the greatest, you want to enter into death, stop learning. Stop thinking. Stop dreaming. Yeah. Wow. When I just stop, sometimes I just stop and think. You know, I'll sit here. And you all got my nice background. You don't see, you can't see where I'm sitting. <laughs> if you saw where I'm sitting, <laughs> you would think you might be in a dump, but I guarantee you it's a garden where a lot of stuff grows. But, but what I'm saying is we have to claim life and we have to model what the flourishing that we expect, the thriving that we expect. They got to see it in us. They have to be able to see I'm a deacon, I'm a trustee, I'm in the fine, and this and that. Uh -huh. uh, I always remind folk about my, my financial uh, uh, a team, because they always want to talk in negatives. Well, you know, we got blah, blah, blah. And I say, no. When are you all going to talk in language that talks about we had this challenge, but if we're faithful, the Lord will provide? When do you speak the language of faith rather than the language of your accounting sense? Because if you start speaking to this congregation the way you're speaking to me, I'll guarantee you everything we got is going to dry up. Okay, that's another digression. I'm preparing for my meeting next week, y'all. <laughs> All right. Uh, can we pull up? Uh, the the characteristics of church growth, congregational growth. Do we have that, Timothy? Yes, sir. Pull, All right, can you pull, pull that up. Let's see. Wait. No, not personal vitality. I'm not going to do that one. Okay. Uh, uh, that takes, there you go. Yes, sir. Now, the reason I pulled this up is is because all the time today, I'll go to conferences and folk are talking about church, church growth. And they're always talking about some gimmick to get new members. And if you want new members, you got to do this and you need to do that and have this kind and that kind of stuff. And now, um, another way of talking about this, uh, and I don't have a chart for it, numerical relates to what is called kerygma. It is evangelization and, and preaching. 
Uh, then you see organical. The word for that is koinonia. How are we growing in fellowship? Uh, maturational is didache. How is our discipling process and how do we expect people to grow in knowledge? Incarnational is diokonia. What kind of expanding ministries are we developing such that we can impact the community? And we're not interested in these people joining our church. We're just interested in making an impact so that we're serving our community. And then there's a liturgical, uh, and uh, this, uh, uh, this relates again, that this word usually in the five-fold aspect of the ministry is, uh, is, is about worship. Is there a growth in a sense of worship? And I'll say more about that. A lot of churches are growing their churches through praise, but they're not growing through worship. People don't have a deeper sense of worship. They have excitement about praise. The problem with that is now is that many people who will praise don't become, are not worshipers who serve God. And those who are leading the praise don't really worship God. My argument, when I'm teaching about this in my classes, I talk about worship precedes praise. Worship is the act of breathing God in. Praise is exhaling. Worship is inhaling. Worship is exhaling. And what we're trying to do is to go from exhaling to inhaling when authentic exhaling is a function of the inhaling. And so we're, we are praise without worship is reduced to performance and excitement. Worship that leads to authentic praise will, gener will come from a heart and a life that's now committed to serve God. Because when I, when I just praise and it's performance, I can shout and then go out and do all kinds of things. I can act any kind of way with my neighbors and with others in the church. But if I worship when I praise, when I leave church, I'm still worshiping. I'm still in walking with God. I'm still living a life that grows from intimacy with God. That's not necessarily just this. But here's when we talk about congregational growth. Yes, we can talk about numerical vitality or flourishing. People are joining the church. Praise be to God. Amen. And what type of programmatic structures do you have? Um, uh, you know, one of the things that you learn is if you want to get parents, get the children. Uh, see, sometimes we want the church, the parents to bring the children to church. But if you develop ministry that draw the children, their parents will come. If none other time than when the children are, are, are singing or doing something, the bottom line is that, that, that numerical is where we call it charismatic or what others would call evangelizing, drawing people uh, into the church. My only challenge is that are you drawing people into God or are you drawing people into an organization? Are we growing people who are growing in relationship with God? Now, the other type of, and usually when you go and the people talk about uh, congregational growth, they stop at the numerical. Are we getting new members? You can be a small church and are, uh, don't see immediate growth in numbers, but the church is growing is because it grows organically. What does organically mean? I mentioned the word koinonia. This means that we are cultivating a true sense of love and fellowship in this church. Um, this, this may sound out of order. Why are you trying to get new members when the folk you got don't even like each other? Just thought. Why are you trying to get more people to be a part of a dysfunctional, diseased organization? where when new members come, people try to get people to be on their side rather than to be committed to the Lord. So part of the growth and what I've been able to see in the church I pastor is just growing people who, who, who we're, we're learning to love each other and to appreciate each other and to care for each other. There's a phrase that we use in our church now, when we greet each other, we say, Sawabona. 
Sawabona me is comes from the South African term and it means we see you. We see you. We see you. You and, and here's the end of it. You have intrinsic worth and dignity, and we see you as a creation of God. And once we say Sawabona to you, we will do nothing to bring harm to you. And we will be present in your life so that you will maximize the intent and desire and design of God for you. We partner with you. How do I grow people who learn how to love? To be honestly in fellowship where each other matter, each other matters. Let me give you an example and how you create a thriving congregation for me. I'm going to give you an example. This morning, uh, um, I have a group of teenagers called Empowered that sang. But I learned that the majority of the people that were singing were all going to their prom this weekend. Guess what we, I did? I brought them all to the altar and anointed them and prayed that God would keep back hurt, harm, and danger during their prom, prom weekend. And we celebrated that they were young and they were gifted and they were beautiful and told each one of them that we love them and we anointed them and that we want you all to enjoy this stage in your life but we also recognize with the beauty, the dignity, the grace that is in you, that there are gonna be forces that would wanna do harm to you. And this day your family covers you with the oil of the spirit. And we want you to go have fun and enjoy yourself. You, 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 you understand? Now you'll say, well, that was simple. What is it? What it makes, it, it creates the context where anything that's going on in anybody's life becomes a matter of us loving each other. It becomes a matter that your pain is my pain and your joy is my joy. How do you create an atmosphere where everybody there begins to show appreciation for each other? And the walls of cliques and families start coming down and how do I as the leader make sure that everybody feels like they're experiencing value and that their pain, that their, their struggle, their issues, their joys, their struggles, they matter and we care about you, okay? Now, so you have numerical growth, perigma, organical growth, koinonia, right? That's fellowship, maturational growth, you know what that is? You may not be getting that more, many more members, but is the vitality of the church is such that there's an excitement because the people who are there are growing in knowledge, understanding. Are you teaching them beyond? One of the ways I try to put this to how to keep the congregation vital is in Matthew, I think there's six times where Jesus says, you have heard it said in times past. Did y'all hear that? But now, do we have a but now church or a times past church? Are we still growing people to have a, a bigger, a larger understanding of meeting God, experiencing God, and understand the greatest threat to knowing God is that you know, you think you know so much already. So even though I've been in Sunday school, I've been in Bible study, I come with an eagerness, teach me, help me to see. I come ready to grow, that we are maturing together. And part of that is, it's even every time I stand before the congregation, I'm supposed, I got a PhD and I'm supposed to be smart. I acknowledge to them how I'm seeking God. I acknowledge to them. And sometimes even in my word, I simply share with them my own wrestlings with God. 
how do we celebrate vitality? Because we're growing in our understanding, in our knowledge. That is the, the Didache. I think Dr. Jensen put that out there. Uh, that's, are we, are, are we a teaching congregation? Amen. And then this is what it's called incarnational. That's where you get the diaconia, from which words you get your word deacon, really. What are we, how are we growing in our ministries? We are, we are having a larger, what we call, we impact our community. We serve and care for our community. There are ways in which we have only taken in five new members, but we, in terms of the impact of this church on the community, we can talk about hundreds. Folk are being fed, come on. Uh, can I say this uh, without being arrogant? We, we may be a, considered a small country church in Negro Foot, Virginia, but that little church has planted a literacy ministry in Ghana. Uh, 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 can, can I say it? Helped build schools in Haiti. That little church has developed an AIDS program in the Cameroon. You understand? There are ways, not only that, Guess what? That little church adopted families that were affected by hurricanes and literally adopted one family and invested in the rebuilding of their home that was destroyed in Houston. Now, we don't go around putting that anywhere, but we can be able to say incarnational growth. How have we expanded the impact on the community? What has been our incarnational growth? That we don't, we don't hesitate to think about what can we do to impact this community? How are we uh, 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 making contributions? How are, we, how are hundreds being uh, influenced or informed by God's presence through how we involve ourselves in the community? And then there's liturgical growth. And the liturgical growth it's what, what I'm talking about is, uh, is, a, is a term of liturgia, which really refers to, are we developing a sense of, um, uh, of worship? I'm not talking about praise. Praise is a dimension, but do we worship? Have we developed a sense of worship where, where, where it's about our encounter with God this past uh, this past Palm Sunday, uh, I went over ag again what happens when praise, praise, the praise breaks out when Jesus comes in, not when you get the right hoop. Uh, the praise came to the community. The praise was spontaneous because the, the, the presence of the Lord is here. And one of the things I try to point out is one of the ways that you can tell when you're in an oppressive worship setting is when everybody is coerced to perform the same way. When Jesus comes in, read it, it said some pulled down coats, laid down cloaks, some pulled down branches, and you can do the exegesis about what those symbolize. It. But the bottom line is not everybody in worship is going to do the same thing. Then some were in front and some were in back. And the reality is I talked about how we can become very abusive in worship where we even do things like this. I don't have any worshipers over here. All because I'm not acting like the way you want me to act, then you exclude me from being a worshiper. When someone who's worshiping, they may not open their mouth, they may not shout, they may weep. They may rock from side to side. When the worship is authentic, the response will be generated by an authentic encounter with the presence and not by our cues. And how do you teach people into just being open and responsive to the presence and to honor God uh, the way the spirit might be directing us? And I do believe there are ways in which we can help vitalize congregations by attending 
to the growth in fellowship, the growth in our educational processes, the growth in our impact, and our commitment to worship. Hallelujah. Praise God. Mm -hmm. That does not do away with the numerical, but it means that my only purpose is not the numerical because if it's only numerical, I generally reduce the people who join to commodities. Huh? I've even been to a conference where the leader said, here's how you get butts in the seats. How offensive. And even suggested that you preach to get butts in the seat. I thought we preached to glorify God and to edify the people. I just, just, you know, I'm old now and I can't hold back my own passion about some of this stuff, okay? Now, I want, it's time for me to get out of here, but look, uh, can you pull up uh, Schnazis? Timothy? Yes, sir. Doc, Dr. Timothy? <laughs> yes, sir. Can you pull up Schnazis? There's a book that we used years ago. I, uh, Denise can probably say when I, I don't have it here before me, I just have the, the sheet. But sh if you look at, I, years ago, I used to use uh, the Albert Institute back in the 90s, had the marks of a healthy congregation. And you, it's amazing how all of these things overlap. But in Sh uh, Schnazi's book about the, the practices of a fruitful or thriving congregation, look at this. And these are not necessarily in the sequencing. I have this actual sequencing of the book here. Um, uh, chapter one. Uh, chapter one is the practice of a radical hospitality. Amen. If you want your a thriving congregation, have welcoming space. Have space where people feel like they're valued, they're affirmed. Where people come in and they don't, they don't feel like strangers. Uh, and can I tell you, when I do a self-analysis of our, we, knew a, we need to do a better job of this, even where I am. My greeters do a wonderful job, but I can do a better job of, uh, of reaching out. And particularly, COVID affected the type of things that we do uh, in the church, you know, because we're, we've created more of a distance. But here's what he said, radical hospitality. It encourages Christians to offer the absolute utmost of themselves, their abilities, and their creativity to welcome people into the community and into the faith. Yeah. And guess what that goes back to? That even relates to charisma and not sep and, and koinonia, that there's a sense of fellowship. Now, this is something in every study that you get, that you do. What do they say? Passionate worship. Listen, passionate worship can transform a worship service and offers this, this chapter offers insights uh, and ideas on how worship that deeply touches people. How do you practice worship? One of the things I've discovered is uh, when I when I know the flock and I invite them, you know, sometimes I call one, I had, uh, last week I had a young lady found out she had breast cancer and she had, um, had to start chemotherapy and radiation, then we'll have to go through surgery. She's very worried and I asked her if I could acknowledge when I talked to her on the phone, but on that Sunday morning, I said, I want to call you to the altar. And we're going to surround you. And then simply by simply something, I, is there anybody else in here who is loving somebody who's dealing with some health issues? Are there some health issues that you have? If you want to intercede for somebody right now, and the, about the whole church came to the altar, but that became a, one of the most meaningful ex moments in the worship. Passionate worship. We just think it's a, a piece of this. 
when you, 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 you think of the entire worship experience and how we are passionate about that worship. Look, look at the next one. I'm going across intentional faith development. You know what that is? That's that whole thing of maturational growth. Uh, in the Alban Institute study they did, I'm talking about almost 20, 30 years ago, it says when people join the church, they learn that, the, that this fellowship does not expect you to be in the same place you were when you joined next year. In other words, when you become a part of this fellowship, you meet a community that is growing and developing in their faith. And we do not are not stuck in a rigid, you've heard it been said, but we're searching for God's but now in this season. Amen. What does, how do we articulate, communicate, and understand our faith? And it's intentional. We're clear about this. When you come to this fellowship, expect to grow. We don't have pat answers to everything. So yes, we will talk about faith and abortion. Mm -hmm. We'll talk about divorce. Amen. We will talk about sexuality and relate all of these things. I expect us to grow and I'm not in the same place. Yes, we must talk about sexual orientation and how do we understand this in when God, and we can't turn to the seven traditional words in the Bible that we use to make judgments, but can we try to discern the character and intent of God and the character of creation? And where do we go for our databases to understand what's going on? Grow, your pastor is growing. Your deacons are growing and we're seeing things, we're learning, and we can tell you how we've grown in our faith. And in this intentional faith development, we gave greater emphasis to the power of the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit expects us to grow. It is that presence of God that is constantly growing you and stretching you. Uh, the Holy Spirit is a dynamic innovator and a creative innovator that's always calling you to a deeper level of consciousness and awareness. And while we focus on the cult of the Holy Spirit, we need to give more attention to the dynamic prophetic character of the Holy Spirit that is constantly growing us into new understanding and deeper relationship with God. Here's the other one. The next one is what? Risk-taking mission and services. Amen. We're willing to place ourselves at risk for the sake, this goes to what? Incarnational. The categories that I, I kind of had and developed, like you can see how this fits right in, uh, that we commit ourselves, come on, to mission. Be using our resources to change lives and transform the world. How do we consciously and faithfully use the resources we have, even though they're limited, to transform people and the world. How do we do it? How do we do this? And so we'll take risk-taking missions. And it means that sometimes on paper, it doesn't look like we can do this. Amen. But in faith, we say we will. Yeah. The next one is what? Extravagant generosity. Amen, <laughs> that we're generous. We are generous in our giving, in our practices, and extravagant generosity relates to total life stewardship. That we commit ourselves to not uh, giving, not taking, but giving. That as we grow, this is very critical, as we grow in intimacy with God, our nature conforms to God. And that nature is not a nature to always draw down and deplete, but to release. But the strange thing is, is when you understand extravagant generosity, all you do is position yourself for greater inflow. And we have been blessed to, uh, blessed by that in terms of, of practicing extravagant generosity. Now, some people don't understand this, 
but that even means uh, I, well, I'm I'm going to put this. Doesn't mean necessarily compensating <laughs> how you compensate the pastor, but how we treat anybody who comes to serve us. Extravagant generosity to God be the glory. And the last thing in this, the sixth chapter of that book, the practice of, of constantly learning, improving, and pursuing excellence. It means that you just don't do these things and count them done. You're constantly doing self-examination and seeing how you can do better. So there are ways in which where, I, where I'm privileged to pastor, there's certain things I can brag on, but we can do so many things better. We can do so much more better. Amen. And so part of the aspect of thriving is, is a commitment to constant learning, a commitment to constantly trying to stand is what it was the language the preacher would use that you stand on the tiptoes of anticipation, expecting God to stretch you beyond your moment and beyond your understanding. So I'm, 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 stop, I'm past my time. Amen. A, uh, I'm not really, I, we, I suppose we have an hour, it's about an hour, but thank you all for privileging me to share with you for a few moments. I don't know Dr. Jansen or Dr. Blunt, if there's a quick question or comment, uh, but I'm, 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 I'm through talking. <laughs> thank you, sir. That was wonderful. You, you, were, you were right on time. Thank you for all of that. I do want to offer if there's a, a person on the call who has a question, uh, for Dr. Kinney, before before we let him on to his afternoon, um, anybody have a question they'd like to offer? And you can either unmute and speak it or put it in the chat, whichever you're more comfortable with. Yes, Dr. Kinney, uh, Minister Green, I just wanted to, uh, first of all, thank you for sharing. Uh, uh, the, the words that we've been able to listen to and gather some information on over the past hour. One, you, you talked about um, if God put me in the garden, uh, then failure is not an option because obviously we know that if it's God in it, then it's not him, it's us. Um, we're in the garden, but there's some other things in the garden with us. And so in terms of tools and trying to... Uh, um, you know, what kind of advice would you have when you're when, when you're in the garden and you're trying to till the ground, you're trying to do the work, uh, um, but there's some weeds in the garden as well that you're trying to pick out. There's some things that you're trying to make sure that the as much of the growth that needs to happen happens in that experience of what you shared. Oops, I think you're muted, sir. Um. You're 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 going to a new congregation. You're 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 start. You you are. Did I did I hear you say that you are uh, going to be installed as pastor? No, no, sir. Um, oh, okay. um, we're 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 without pastor right uh -huh. now, and so we're okay. just operating uh, uh, in that space. Uh, I was minister there before the pastor left, and I'm still the minister there now. So okay, just trying to help uh, the leadership. Yes, okay. sir. All right. Now let me anytime. Can I just say this? Anytime you're without a pastor, there will always be those who will try to become the pastor <laughs> without a calling to the pastor. <laughs> no, literally, literally, when we talk about when a church is without a shepherd, there is a there is a a vacuum. You know, there's a place, and there will always be those elements who will want to take that place. And the longer you're without a pastor, the longer it takes for a pastor to become the pastor. Yeah. <laughs> uh, because of people who assume roles and then locate themselves in their roles and they view the pastor as a threat to their roles because they want to maintain their roles. But the other thing I caution people about, sometimes you've got to let the wheat grow with the tares. Mm -hmm. And don't focus on the weeds, focus on growing more wheat. And don't let the weeds choke out the wheat. Let the wheat choke out the, the weeds. <laughs> you, you, you understand what I'm saying? Yes, um, sir. It's oftentimes I made this mistake in ministry myself. It's just like if you if you have a foreign object in a bottle, let's say I, let's say I have a bottle of water. I don't have an object here for teaching purposes. 
if you fill up a bottle of water and you see in there uh, of some foreign object, right? Here's what people do. We do it in our church meetings. We do, uh, when we get into an opportunity, what we focus on is the negative in all the water. All we talk about is this negative. You see that? Look at that in there. There's a piece of dirt in there. That dirt shouldn't be in there. What are we going to do about this dirt? And nobody affirms or uh, embraces all the water that's around the piece of dirt. Then invariably, when we have our, the way that we resolve the problem is, we start shaking. We're going to get this dirt out of here. And we start shaking that bottle and shaking it to get the dirt out. By the time you get the dirt out, oh, most of the water in the bottle is gone. You have, in a very real sense, a weakened and diminished your fellowship because you're focusing on what's wrong in it rather than giving attention to it. If you want to get the dirt out, put it under a water spigot and let more fresh water come in and the dirt will blow out because there's too much fresh in here. Amen. No, you, 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 you under, and it's a whole, it's, some people don't understand that um, because even as a pastor and even as a dean, there's always somebody who wants to tell you how to handle the problem. And here's what you need to do. Uh, you need to cuss somebody, no. <laughs> or you need to get in the meeting and you need to tell them this and you need to do this and do that. And sometimes you just have to sit there hmm. and listen and be as wise as a serpent and as gentle as a dove. And one of the things I would tell all of you as leaders, you never allow what's coming at you to dictate what comes from you. Because mm. anytime you move into leadership, some stuff is gonna come at you. But you never allow what's coming at you to determine what comes from you. Because if what's coming at you comes from you, what's at you is now in you. Mm. And you are no different from that which is coming at you. And you, I, I will tell you, Minister Green, as you move into ministry, some people will even interpret that as weakness. When in fact, it's the depth of your strength. And I will not give you the power to control my demeanor or my behavior. And sometimes in my own personal journey, where I've had to get up and leave some places because I recognize what was coming at me was going to come from me. <laughs> okay, I, I, I can be honest now at this stage in my life. And the best thing I do is, my, my, like my mama said, count to 10. Mm. And if counting 10 doesn't work, go to another room until you're ready to handle this. Room. <laughs> no. But seriously, what I'm saying is, one of the things is, when God gives you the capacity to see deception and evil, never make what you see the focus of your ministry. Make the God you know. Because he's not letting you see so that they control the ministry. They're, he's letting you see so you can be the agent of healing and restoration. Mm. And letting you know that you're going to have to deal with this kind of stuff now. You deal with it under my authority in my name and not under the authority of those who are trying to destroy something. Because once you start acting like they act, then you all become a community of destroyers. <laughs> who are you going to destroy and I'm going to destroy you? No. When do, how do I do that? And where do you find, rather than focusing that I got some weeds, where are all of the fruit that's growing? How do I encourage them? How do I nurture them? How do I make sure that the focus and the life of this church is driven by the healthy and the vital and not the diseased and the destructive? And I always have to ask God for discernment about what time it is. Because there may be a time that surgery and turning over the money tables will be necessary but that is not my modus operandi. Okay. All right, y'all, I'm gone. My family calling me. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Kinney. Okay. God bless you all. Enjoy the rest of your day. Will you hey, join hey. me in thanking Dr. Okay. Kinney? <laughs> uh -huh.